All right, so you guys are going to see these splash sides a lot of times, Creative Commons. Um, the first module, we're just going to give you an introduction to the cloud because everything that we're going to be doing for this whole workshop is going to happen almost, I would say, like 95% of it is going to happen on some compute instances that we've set up in the Amazon cloud. So we want to give you a little bit of background. Thank you. A little bit of background on uh, the cloud, and also we're going to go through uh, the practical exercise of getting you connected to the cloud during this uh, lecture. So these slides were actually produced uh, primarily by Francis, and we've made some uh, minor modifications. Uh, and obviously, Steven is really the guy that's helped set up the cloud in the past. So <clears throat> this is an overview of the learning objectives for the whole course, and we're going to kind of find. Uh, follow this pattern where we do a uh, lecture and lab for these, uh, I guess, four slash five modules, and we're on module zero right now. Uh, the tutorials, the idea is that they will provide a complete working example of an RNA seq pipeline up to uh, expression and differential expression analysis uh, and alternative expression analysis as well. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, in order to get these um, pipelines to run in a reasonable amount of time with modest computer resources. We've created these kind of dummy data sets, but um, the pipelines as developed should work uh, on your own data, you know, with some minor additional setup. And we hope that it's uh, fairly self-contained and self-explanatory and portable, the material. We really strive for that. So in this module, I'm just going to introduce the idea of cloud computing. And then we're going to go to the wikis. There's actually two wikis for this workshop, and we'll explain about that, and then go into how to log into the cloud. So as a background, how many have you seen um, this plot or something like it before? Most of you. This is actually a common like uh, conference bingo thing now at like, genomic conferences. The, uh, the Moore's Law slide showing that uh, the amount of uh, sequencing base pairs you can get from next-gen sequence technologies per dollar uh, has, you know, increased exponentially. Um, and unfortunately, the message of this slide is that uh, other necessary components such as disk storage and compute power have not scaled at the same rate as our ability to produce the data. And this creates uh, analysis challenges. So what, what we have is basically a doubling time of uh, next-gen sequencing around every four months. You can produce uh, twice the data for the same price, uh, whereas it's uh, something like 14 months to double your storage. So we're going to hit, and actually we have pretty much hit the $1,000 genome uh, late last year or this year, depending on you know, who you ask and how they charge. Uh, at the Genome Institute where I work, it's a, about $1,100 to do a 30x whole genome. Um, so we're starting to think already about the $100 genome after many years of waiting for this $1,000 genome. Uh, we already talked about uh, the doubling times, but basically the point is, at some point here, it's actually going to cost less to sequence a base pair again than to, to, than to store it long term. We're not quite there yet, but... Um, storage is a major, major cost. So what's a general biomedical scientist to do? We have tons and tons of data coming from experiments like RNA-seq that we're going to be talking about in this workshop. A lot of labs don't really have the IT infrastructure to support that kind of effort. I mean, you need significant compute resources, lots of storage, and also the expertise to use it, of course. Um, but expertise can be trained, but to some degree, it's just not practical for every lab to set up their own storage and compute um, cluster. So where do they go? They can write more grants and try to get bigger hardware, um, but uh, we would argue that an alternative to that is perhaps to go onto the cloud. So the particular flavor of the cloud that we're using is Amazon Web Services. Um, they've provided a grant to support this workshop and to give you all access to the cloud during uh, this workshop. But they're, they're not the only options, so um, you know, there are options from Google and others. 
Uh, the main components of AWS or Amazon Web Services that we're going to use are called um, S3, which is for uh, simple storage service, and EC2 for elastic cloud computing. So S3 is a large storage service where you can keep your data, and EC2 is actually um, the computer that you're running your analysis on. And the idea of this is that it's, it's ready when you are high performance computing. So you spin up computers uh, when you need them and shut them off or uh, deactivate them when you don't. And there's basically these huge football fields sized high performance compute clusters throughout the world at various centers um, that's very expandable for Amazon. Um, and basically for our int intents and purposes, it's infinite compute resources. Um, of course, it's not free, but in terms of whatever you need to analyze, Amazon for sure has enough compute power to do it. So as I said, some of the challenges of cloud computing, I, it's like really for me, actually, cost remains one of the higher ones. Pricing is getting better and better. It's quite a competitive sphere. Um, there are, as I said, Amazon and Google and other players um, who are competing in this space, and the prices continue to come down. But if you're in an academic setting at a university that um, kind of gives you a sweetheart deal where maybe they pay for the electricity or they pay for um, certain aspects of the facilities, you may find that uh, it's still cheaper to do your analysis uh, at home in your own institute or um, through access to a shared compute resource like uh, Compute Canada or something like that. Uh, I think people that work in the cloud industry would say when you actually tally up all of the hidden costs um, that Amazon is very competitive and perhaps cheaper and I think it's no doubt that those costs I mean they just have the power of scale and efficiencies that we can't really compete with at, at individual centers I, I think it's very likely that we're going to be moving a lot of our analysis to the cloud um, and there's going to be less of these kind of homegrown solutions it's not the best solution for everybody. Um, there are issues potentially with standardization. Um, and I think one of the biggest is the personal health information. So for those of you that work in the human health domain, that is a concern, right? You're putting your data up in this black box called the cloud, and you have to be concerned about security and um, who can access that data and what happens if, I don't know, the NSA decides to go through all of Amazon's records. Is that a concern for you? that sort of thing. In the US we have uh, several acts like the HIPAA Act that pertain to this kind of information and it's a very complicated sphere. It's not at all clear to me from people I've talked to uh, whether this has been resolved but there are certainly hospital systems I know of that are moving onto the cloud. Um, Amazon is obviously working very hard to make sure that they're compliant with these uh, laws and regulations and ultimately it's up to you or the or people that you hire to make sure that your data is as or more secure on the cloud as it would be in a locked uh, room in your basement of your hospital or your institute. Do you think that in some ways the, the genomic data, uh, it's still a question of being behind policy where you're right that there's nothing more personal, but at the same time, I know in the States, we still haven't officially declared that genome sequence data is the same as telephone numbers and birth dates and other kinds of PHI. So I wonder, like, are you aware of anyone in Canada, for example, that allows their EHRs to be, or EMRs to be put in the cloud? In the cloud, I'm not sure about that. But I know that, so part of the operas, you see the bioethicists involved with uh, many of the global alliance and the ICGs and so forth. You go, you go. Uh, she is very much cloud aware. Of, I think she considers it as a, if anything, I would argue that Amazon is more secure than any university's computer. Yeah. So, so any policy that allows you to do it in a, in a university computer, but not in Amazon, is going to be on yeah, Policies don't always make sense. I would, I would no, agree with you, know. though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So advantages of cloud computing, we talked about some of the challenges. Um, one is, of course, we receive grants from Amazon, so that's great for us to be able to provide this workshop um, without co compute cost. It's extremely convenient. Uh, we don't have to lug 
computers here that we've set up in advance. We do it sort of all virtually. Um, there are getting to be better ways of transferring large files, uh, which in the past has been a challenge. Um, and AWS now makes it free to upload files. Uh, there are a number of data sets that already exist in the cloud. So if you're using things like the thousand genomes data, you don't need to worry about how to get that uploaded to the cloud. You can probably just find it being hosted somewhere in the cloud already. And there are many useful bioinformatics, what are called Amazon machine images, which is kind of like a clone of a computer that you've set up for some specific purpose. And there are some examples like Cloud BioLinux, where it's been set up specifically for bioinformatics. So all the common bioinformatics tools that you would want to use have been sort of pre-installed and set up for you. So when you connect to an instance of that type, you have like basically this powerful bioinformatics computer already set up for you. And actually, we have one for this course now that's the same kind of idea. So the cloud that you're going to be, the, the specific instance type that you're going to be connecting to on this cloud, uh, you could later in your own lab use that as your starting point if you want to do your analysis on the cloud. So in this workshop, if you're not very computer um, comfortable, if you're still new to informatics, it's going to take a little bit to adjust uh, because you're using data and tools that are on your computer. Uh, some of them are on the web and some of, the, some of them are on the cloud. And we're going to try and help you become efficient at uh, traversing through these different spaces and using what's best. The ways that we're going to interact with the, the cloud in this workshop are through the command line, so through a terminal application, uh, which is basically just like connecting to your, your own Unix box. If you had one in a closet or a server room somewhere, uh, the only difference is it, it lives in Oregon or North Virginia or somewhere where Amazon sets up their, their computers. Um, we're also going to use the, a web browser in a very limited way to browse through data that's uh, served on the, on the web from your instances. Uh, but there are more sophisticated ways of accessing the cloud through the web, uh, such as the Galaxy. Uh, but we don't do that in this workshop. So things that we've set up in advance for this course. Uh, all of the necessary data files, for the most part, have been loaded on an FTP server that you're going to download at various times through the, the lab components. And then we set up this uh, Linux instance. It happens to be an Ubuntu instance. And we loaded a whole bunch of software for the RNA-seq analysis on that instance. And then we made a kind of copy of that and created separate instances for everyone in the class. So each of you is going to be logging into your own uh, instance of this um, kind of RNA-seq specialized Unix box. The, we're going to go through this, but on your name tags is a number, and that tells you the number of your computer. So it's really important to use your number because you're connecting to your instance. If you connect to someone else's, you could be both trying to uh, write the same file at the same time or running commands that are going to kind of compete with each other and clobber each other. And believe me, it will cause a lot of problems. So uh, remember your number. We've done all this setup for you. Uh, so in a way, it's convenient for the workshop to just be able to start and get into the RNA-seq analysis rather than spending a bunch of time with you guys having to learn the cloud. Uh, but I did want to kind of just really quickly introduce you to what that's like. So you have a general idea. If you want to use Amazon back home, what is this setup process like? So I thought we would just like really quickly go and look at if I can get this to work. Can you guys see that OK? So this is the AWS Management Console. And that's where we set up these cloud instances. So if I sign into this console, um, you would have to create an account. It's not really any different than um, setting up a Google account. And in fact, if you already have an Amazon account, who doesn't have an Amazon account, right, for ordering stuff or watching videos, uh, then you can use that even. Um, you just have to connect a, a credit card to it if you haven't already. Be careful with that, though, right, because you can start up a very powerful computer and forget about it, and then you get this crazy bill. And yeah, it's, it's happened to more than one of us, so uh, buyer beware. 
Uh, you can see there's a huge number of resources and different services that Amazon provides. If you look through the list, you'll see the two that I talked about. These are really the only two that you would need to worry about as a basic beginner. S3 is where you can set up storage so you can buy terabytes or petabytes even of storage that you need to store your data and you're not really buying it so much as renting it. And you can also set up these EC2 instances. So if we go to EC2, um, this is kind of like the um, console that shows what I have running. So at the moment I actually have an instance uh, running in my account uh, for another purpose. Uh, so if we click on that we can look in the console and see, okay, there's there's this computer that I call GMS Review. It's it's for a paper where we we set up a computer that runs some software that we want our reviewers to be able to test out. This is another really useful way of using the cloud. Um, and so that's running right now, and it's an instance of this type, which is actually quite a good instance. So this is actually probably costing us a fair bit of money. Again, we had a grant for that as well. So you can get both education grants to do workshops like this, and you can get research grants um, to kind of prove principles. And they're quite interested in genomics research, so I think they're pretty open to um, research grants in this area. But uh, say we want to make a new instance, you would use this launch instance button. And here you can choose an existing AMI um, Setting up an AMI is a little bit more advanced, so we would probably choose an existing one. Um, you can search through the uh, community of AMIs where people have created uh, one of these Amazon machine instances and made it public. Uh, and that's what we've actually done for this course. I don't know if I can remember the name of it, though. Uh, maybe it's Cold Spring Harbor has one. Yeah, so here's one we set up for another course. Um, okay, yeah. So if you have the name or kind of uh, part of the name that you can search for, you can find a, a previously set up instance and you can select that. And then it takes you through this wizard where you basically choose uh, different options like how much compute do you need. So here there are all these different types and they tell you um, how many CPUs they have, how much memory they have, how much storage they come pre-configured with. You can always connect more storage to them. Uh, there are actually free computer instance types. So if you just want to play around, uh, you can fire up an instance with this uh, micro instance. So it's not very powerful. It's maybe like as good as your laptop or something. But for uh, testing and demonstration purposes, it's really useful and it doesn't cost you anything. And you, there's maybe like, I don't know, five or six steps you click through um, and choose some options. For the most part, you can go with a lot of default settings. Uh, and then when you're done, you would launch. And it would create an instance. After a few minutes, it kind of like clicks and whirs. It takes a little while for that computer to uh, get set up at Amazon. And then it'll say uh, it's running. And at that point, you can connect to it and use it. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this course. But we've just done this work uh, for you guys in advance. So that was a very brief intro to the idea of setting up your own instance. Uh, at the end of this workshop, there's a link where you can see a very detailed tutorial on how you would do this, which is basically a documentation of how we did it for this course. So if you want to set it up, uh, there's instructions. Was it at any point asked exactly how much So there are um, prices for um, the instance types, it says right up front, this is how much per hour that instance type costs. Um, for storage, it tells you how much per gigabase it costs. So you can do like some back of the envelope calculations. Uh, there are also tools that will help you try to estimate. It is a little bit challenging, I find, to, to accurately estimate how much it's going to cost. And there are also tools that can send you Right, so you can set up, um, so I have that set up now, thankfully. Um, you can set up uh, alerts, basically, and say, if my bill goes over $100, tell me, tell me, just give me a summary every day how much this is costing me. So they do have some pretty sophisticated tools to help you track what things are costing. But you need to be pretty proactive if you want to keep your costs down, like about turning things off when you don't need them and things like that. So, like, do you have... Would you be able to say, like, for a 30 gig 
data, up to data set of RNA seq to do this pipeline, how much that's going to cost you, or is that oh. too hard? If that's too hard, that's okay. I'm just curious. Yeah, for like a normal data set, normal size data set. So. Pricing. Yeah, so the there's like an AWS. Um, it could be its own course almost. There's a lot of material there, um, and uh, Malachi is. It's almost like an FAQ, and that's one of the questions. Like, how much is this going to cost me? And so it kind of goes through some examples. Uh, but if you go to let's see, they do have it. So for example, here. No, you guys can't see this. What happened? If you go to um, Amazon.com slash EC2 slash pricing. Um, you can see like the cost per hour. So we could think like, okay, let's say you have a tumor normal that you want to run through RNA seq, and they each have one lane of high seq data, and you think it's going to take 12 hours for alignment and another 12 hours for expression and differential expression analysis or something. Maybe it's 24 hours times one of these instance types per hour. We probably want, let's say, I don't know, at least eight CPUs, and yeah, we could go through the exercise. I, it would probably be, I mean, you can see kind of roughly what the prices are. They're between like tens of cents per hour up to a dollar something per hour for the really good instances. So think like maybe ten to thirty dollars. But the devil's really in the details in terms of like. It's sometimes it's very hard to predict how long an alignment will take, or especially some of the downstream steps that we're going to show you. It can be unpredictable, and sometimes you have to do it twice. Yeah. yeah. In that case, if you're picking an instance, you're not really, you don't, your job is not necessarily queue for people. And is, it, is it based in a, in a queue system, or do you get like instant access to it? Yeah, this way there is something kind of like what you're talking about where um, you can set up a job and when some uh, store or compute becomes available, uh, your process will run. But what we're talking about here is basically like renting a computer. You start it, it's your computer, no one else can use it, you pay for it while it's turned on whether you're using it or not. So if you're not ready to run your jobs, then... No. Yeah, no. Once once you ha like spin up that instance, that, that compute is, is yours to use as efficiently or inefficiently as you can, but you're going to get billed the same for it either way, yeah, pretty, also pretty much. Instances. Right, so that's the other way of going that I'm talking it's about. When the price, you see, I'll do my computes when the price is less than this amount. And so the, the prices <laughs> fluctuate throughout the day depending on how busy the system is. When it's less busy, the, the price becomes cheaper. So then you can actually do the experiments when it's cheaper. Like if things are queued up, waiting for the, the spot instance to reach a low price, then you can do it at that cost. Type thing you might do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Michelle is giving me the, we're running out of time, frantic. frantic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for this workshop, uh, we're going to get you guys on the wiki. Um, have, has everyone actually already uh, gone to the bioinformatics.ca wiki yet? If not, this would be a good time. Everyone has. I guess uh, Michelle set that up before. So you should have your username and password. If for some reason you've had problems getting onto this wiki, um, let us know with your red uh, sticker. Um, on the main page, you want to find the informatics uh, for RNA-Seq. Sorry, the wrong one is highlighted, but the uh, RNA-Seq workshop wiki is the one we're using. As I mentioned, there's a second wiki, so you may not have been here yet. Um, if you go to www.rnaseq.wiki, that's where all of the actual um, lab materials are laid out. So the course wiki kind of provides you with 
the high level information about bioinformatics with workshops in general and and links to this wiki and other resources uh, but when, when we're when we're doing the labs we're going to be using rnaseq.wiki this is something that Malka and I set up basically because we give this kind of a variation of this workshop in more than one venue so uh, we can't use the Canadian bioinformatics workshop wiki at some of those other venues so we have kind of third-party location for it so logging into Amazon this you guys probably have not done yet, right? Okay. So is everyone either on Mac or Windows? Or do we have some Linux users? Oh, we have some Linux users. Okay. So if you're on Linux, um, you probably are, I'm guessing, more familiar unless you're borrowing the Linux computer. Um, but it's going to be more similar to the Mac instructions than the Windows instructions. Um, you're basically going to have to find your terminal application. So if you're on the Mac, you want to go into Applications, Utilities, and then find the app that's called Terminal, Terminal.app, and start that. If you're on Windows, um, you want to start, uh, what do we recommend these guys use, Putty, I guess? Yeah, so that was something that was provided in the pre-workshop instructions, I believe, that you install Putty if you're bringing your own Windows laptop. So at this time, can you guys either start up Terminal on the Mac or Linux or Putty on Windows? And if you have problems, use your stickers. So the, the terminal application is basically an application that allows you to interact with your computer, with the file system on your computer, through a command line mode, right, where everything is text-based. It's the alternative to what we're no, more commonly using, which is a graphical user interface, right, like Windows or Mac, where it's the start button or the Apple button and using the file browsers and things like that. Once you start doing bioinformatics, you realize you pretty much need to do things on the command line. There just aren't enough applications that have been made into the graphical type software. So in your terminal application, um, wherever you are, uh, you may want to, uh, on the Mac or Linux at least, make a new directory. And you can do that with the make dir command, mkdir. This should have been something you guys reviewed if you did your homework before the course, your intro to Linux. So we're just going to make a folder to put um, a file in. And you can do that with make dir, and in this example, we're calling it the cbw folder. And then you can use cd to change into that folder. And then you can use ls to list the contents of that folder, which are going to be empty since you just created it. If you're on Windows, um, you can just create a directory on your um, desktop or in your home directory using the usual right-click, new folder, uh, make a new directory. Once you have this folder, we're going to go and save uh, what's called a, a key file. And this is uh, basically something that allows you to connect securely to these instances on the cloud. So that you have to have this key to connect, which is what's preventing uh, you know, someone else out in the world from noticing that we have started these instances up and just grabbing onto them and using them for their own nefarious purposes. And believe me, people would do that. <laughs> Move on to the actual RNA-seq workshop. Uh, so you're not going to do this right now, but just... To give you an idea, you can uh, copy files from AWS to your computer. So as we're doing this, if for some reason uh, you create a file that you want to keep and take home with you, uh, you will need to save that to your own computer because these instances right, that you're working in are going to be uh, deleted after we're done the workshop uh, because we don't have money to just keep them running forever. Uh, so there's a few different ways you can do that. 
one of the most convenient ways is we've set up these instances to basically serve the contents of the file system on them to the web. So you can go in your browser to that same URL, uh, cbw and your number .dyndns.info, and it will show you um, the kind of like home folder of your system. And I don't think you'll see much there right now, but because we haven't done much yet. But you could bookmark it, yeah. So uh, it's really hard for me to do this without the mirroring mode, but yeah. So if I go to CBW, and you said I was 49, is that? CBW 49. Info. And there you can see what I have in my home directory. It's probably more than what you have because other instructors have been using this instance. And you can just browse through that like you would and download files. Um, another option besides browsing uh, is using the SCP command. Uh, so from your terminal application at the command line, you can do something like this. It's a lot like the SSH command. So you would say SCP and then dash I and give your key file. Everything is exactly like the SSH command. Then your user, which is Ubuntu, and then your host name, which is the CBW number dot DYN DNS dot info, and then the colon, and then the path to the file that you want to download and then the destination, which in this case we're using just a single dot to indicate uh, the current location on your computer. So this would go to Amazon, to the workspace folder, grab the nicealignments.bam file, and download it to the current directory on your own computer. So this won't work yet because we haven't created any files. Right, this file doesn't exist yet, so it'll just give an error. Just an example. should really learn to use those animations. Okay, so at this point your laptop for the workshop should be set up. Um, if it's not, uh, you know how to go to the, the main CBW wiki to get information on connecting to the, to the cloud, um, and you know how to use that wiki for the workshop. Um, all the lectures are there as well. Uh, I believe they're on both um, the main wiki and rnaseq.wiki, so you can find them in either location. Uh, you've read the pre-lecture material, right guys? And you've done the pre-lecture uh, or pre-course uh, homework, and you know how to log into AWS. So this is the tutorial I mentioned. If you want to know a lot more detail about using the cloud, connecting to the cloud, uh, setting up Amazon Machine Instance, like what we set up for you, then there's very detailed uh, instructions there on uh, rnaseq.wiki. Uh, all kinds of just general questions as well, like understanding about the different regions and how does billing work that we had questions about. So there's a lot of useful information there if you just want to really understand more about the cloud. So I think we're on coffee break now, Michelle, is that right?